Let's go to our guest. Joining us from London is the Russian political analyst and former Kremlin advisor Alexander Nakrasov. With us here in Washington is Anska Graf. He's the senior political correspondent for Die Welt and several other German newspapers from New York. We're joined by Ukrainian activist and attorney Ivana Bilic. And also with us here in Washington is a former U.S. ambassador to the Ukraine, Roman Papadiuk. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Ambassador, let me start with you. The fact that these talks are still going on, as we just heard from our correspondent, it's 2 a.m., just past 2 a.m. in Minsk. What does that tell you? Well, that uh, gives us a pause in a uh, cause for optimism, quite frankly, in the sense that anytime people are talking, it's much better than uh, fighting. Uh, I think the the fact that the talks are still ongoing is a continuation of the discussions that Merkel and Hollande had in, in Moscow. As you realize, during those talks, when they finished those talks, they came out and said that they weren't negative on the talks, but, but they weren't very positive. They were at least somewhat neutral. At the same time, nothing leaked from those Moscow talks, which indicated that there were serious negotiations, ongoing serious proposals that all, all sides were considering. So I think that Moscow conversation has carried over into Minsk. So I would take this as a cautionary positive step that things are possibly moving in the right direction. Let's go to Alexander Nekrasov in London. Uh, Alexander, do you see it the same way, that this is possibly uh, a positive thing, that fact that the talks have not ended, that we can only expect a statement tomorrow? Well, to be honest with you, it's a cliche now to, uh, when, when we say that it's good to talk and that when diplomats are talking or leaders are talking, things are going to happen. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much faith in these uh, discussions because, okay, so they will have a, uh, uh, some sort of a communique or declaration but how will it be implemented on the ground? That's the main key problem. And we already had one ceasefire agreement in Minsk, and it didn't last. And basically, it was broken at once, immediately. So the same thing might happen again. I don't really see anything on the table that is worthwhile talking about. And I also don't understand why we hear politicians saying it's the last chance for peace. You know, if, if these talks don't succeed, then everything will go, everything will fall apart. It won't. There will be more talks, there will be more meetings. And I think the most important thing is to bring together Kiev and the anti-government rebels. These are the two sides that basically hold the key to the success of any uh, agreement. If they don't abide by it, and both sides didn't in the last count, then nothing will happen. And whatever Hollande and, and Putin and Merkel and Obama would say, nothing will work. So we need these two sides to, co to, to comply with some sort of an agreement which will be on the table. At the moment, I don't see that happening. Okay, let's go to Ivana in New York. And Ivana, uh, Alexander making the point there that it will not change the situation on the ground, these talks. And we know that... There are people being affected uh, in that part of Ukraine. More than 5,000 people killed, 13,000 wounded. Up to a million people, we understand, have been displaced. How do you see this evolve? Uh, Anand, and I uh, actually very, I'm very skeptical of those talks. I'm very skeptical because the, the main uh, agreement has been broken before. Russia broke the Belovetsky uh, Pushcha Accords, uh, Budapest Memorandum, uh, other international treaties uh, and agreements. And uh, from where I stand, uh, the international law and order is, has, uh, as we know, uh, and has been built from after the World War II and has been dismantled. And uh, I don't have any faith in uh, uh, Russia, Russia's participation in those uh, talks. Also, I'm a, I'm a little bit surprised why Russia, if it's not part, uh, party to the conflict, why is it um, even at the table? Also, I'm a little bit skeptical about the Viktor Medvedchuk's mandate, as well as uh, many Ukrainians. Uh, we know that Ukrainians feel very strongly about the territorial integrity and the so its sovereignty. We know that the country has been independent and uh, they take it very seriously, as well as uh, the rest of us in the civilized world. And uh, I'm skeptical, I'm hopeful, I don't want more people to be displaced. But at the same time, uh, this is a very serious global threat and issue, and we should look at this very seriously. And it's not uh, a conversation between uh, the United States and Russia. It's about the people in Ukraine, 
and um, right and it's it and the rest of the country and also I would like to bring another point there is right. there is a reason why we don't negotiate with terrorists and uh, the rebels supported by Russia uh, so far fit the definition fit the shoe thank you okay Anska um, Europe has a big stake in this Germany appears to have staked its uh, considerable prestige in Thank these you. talks. The German Chancellor is involved in them as well. Uh, how big a risk is this for Germany and why is she so deeply involved in this? She is deeply involved because she has a close ties to Vladimir Putin. She is able to speak and understand uh, the Russian language uh, and Germany has uh, close trade ties uh, with Moscow and therefore I think it's a good kind of labor of international labor division uh, that um, Angela Merkel for the Europeans tries to negotiate uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and maybe another part, a new part of this international um, labor division could become that uh, there will be uh, starting maybe only two days ago in, in uh, during this White House meeting uh, of Merkel and uh, Obama that they will perform kind of a bad cop, good cop game. Uh, Merkel would, uh, would stay in this line to, to be the good cop. She would uh, try to, to negotiate, to speak with Vladimir Putin as she right now does in Minsk. And uh, Obama could, uh, we don't know whether he will in the end, but he could uh, decide to, uh, to deliver um, defensive weapons to the Ukrainian army. And maybe in the end, uh, in the beginning, the, your colleague uh, said it's a split between United States and Europe. This uh, split could also be an advantage because they now can, can play on both sides, on the, the negotiation table and on the question of arming the Ukrainian army. Right, Ambassador, if I, mm -hmm. if I could just take that good cop, bad cop analogy just one step further. If the United States is threatening to supply weapons to the Ukrainian government, mm -hmm. if it wants to tighten sanctions on Russia, does the United States believe that if and when it does this, that Russia... Uh, will just say, okay, we give up, we walk away from this, we accept defeat. Well, it's not, we don't know how it will turn out, but let's take the issue of arms uh, for Ukraine. Uh, we're talking about defensive arms for Ukraine. I think it behooves the, the Western community and those that support Ukraine uh, to consider seriously uh, giving arms to Ukraine for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, defensive arms for Ukraine would allow Ukraine to create a defensive perimeter in, t in terms of uh, raising the cost for any future separatist activities to try to expand their area of control. So there'll be a cost factor that will be involved that is not currently present given the weak state of the Ukrainian military and, and its equipment. The second thing that arms would do is strengthen the Ukrainians at the diplomatic table. Ukraine now comes to the diplomatic table basically empty-handed. It has nothing but its own uh, goodwill to negotiate a solution to this. But uh, diplomacy and um, arms have always gone hand in hand. To have a good diplomacy, you have to have some kind of military backing. And I think that if the president decided to provide that kind of defensive military equipment to Ukraine, Ukraine would have that kind of capacity at the diplomatic table should these talks uh, fall apart. So I do see uh, the, uh, the current talks as possibly moving forward since the president is openly considering defensive military equipment for Ukraine, and that's a threat. And Russia knows that that raises the bar and raises the cost that they would incur in terms of uh, supporting the separatists and weaken the separatists in their own activities in trying to force the Ukrainian military further from the perimeter lines that have been drawn. Okay, let me get the view quickly of Alexander in London. Alexander, will the Russians uh, capitulate in this way? Will they give in to duress of this kind? Of course not. And I think that what Obama is playing a dangerous game. You know, Americans have already caused the mess in Iraq and Libya and in Syria and so on. Now they're trying to do the same in, uh, in Ukraine. I think that if America decides, uh, you know, first of all, uh, what to be defensive weapons, of course there will be offensive weapons. And if this start, this will escalate the conflict to a completely different level. Uh, Merkel has po pointed it out already. The Europeans are terrified of that because the conflict will spread quickly. For, and, and, and this is clear to everyone apart from Obama, it seems. And I think Obama should really stay out of this. If this conflict needs, it has, it needs to be resolved in a proper way, it needs to be done in Europe by the Europeans uh, and o obviously by the Ukrainians themselves, first of all, but with the Europeans in the background. With, with, now, until with we have some sort of dialogue, 
I have some sort of dialogue. No, I'm sorry, I, I, I just need to finish this point. Until we have a proper okay. dialogue between Kyiv's government and the uh, anti-government uh, forces in the East, nothing will change. Okay. At the moment, we have a president in Kyiv who doesn't really know what to do, and we have the determined rebels who are, seem to be keen on getting more territory. So how on earth anyone can happen with threatening to supply the Kyiv's army with, with uh, offensive weapons, which they call defensive, this will cause a total mess in Ukraine. Okay, I want to